the recording now. The recording has started. So thank you all ever so much for coming to our second day um, of the workshop, Copyright Issues in Secondary Data Use. Um, it's a pleasure to, to have so many of you attending. Um, Yesterday, we've uh, ended up with uh, the most interesting thing fact you've learned uh, with a menti available. Um, and we've seen a couple of people really enjoy the Q&A sessions. That's fantastic. We do have some plan today and we have uh, also an activity group, um, which uh, not to uh, scare anyone, it can be done individually or in a group, um, uh, however you would like, but we're going to have a discussion based on that. And it's actually around how we look at whether we can use um, and share secondary sources or not. Once again, a huge thank you to our um, shock um, partners that funded the event. Um, if you have not heard about SHOCK before the event, please do visit their website. The links are available. Um, the training materials available via SHOCK are incredibly useful for day-to-day -day activities if you work in an archive repository or research um, institution, but also from a trainer's perspective as well. So in regards to housekeeping, as mentioned, only the presentations are recorded and we're going to send them shortly to you. We do have the slides available and I'm going to put the link in the chat in just a minute. Um, questions, we are keeping the same Padlet. The Padlet worked amazingly well um, yesterday and I'm very happy of that. Everyone seemed to enjoy to be able to um, enter questions anonymously. However, if you do want to ask questions in the chat, you're, you're more than welcome to. And in the Q&A sessions, if you just want to unmute yourself, um, that is all fine. We do have the post event feedback. You're going to circulate the form um, and you would be extremely grateful for the form to be completed. It gives us some ideas of how the workshop went and other um, uh, ideas for workshops in the future. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shortly share, if I can find it, there it is, our Google Drive. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. Everyone should have now received the Google Drive link. Do let me know if you have any struggles with the Google Drive, if the link doesn't work. Um, I hope I said the permissions correctly, um, but do let me know if that's not the case. In the Google Drive, um, you will find two folders up top and also the program and description of the workshop today. In day one, we have all the presentations from day one and later on, I'm going to add the menti results as well for everyone to see. And in day two, we have the presentations from today and also the activity we're going to work through um, at half 11 today. So please do let me know any problems with the, with the Google Drive uh, and I'll, I'll sort that out. Now, today we only have three speakers and facilitators. We have Hina Vahid, um, we have Anka Vlad, um, and Christina Magder, um, yours truly. Um, it's more um, of the same concepts as of yesterday with the presentations, the Q&A sessions, um, and the group activity. Um, but once again, please do use the Padlet um, for different questions you might have. If we're looking at a recap of day one, We've seen the history of copyright. Um, we thought it would be very useful to actually introduce the basic copyright concepts to different aspects from publications to teaching to research data. As we've seen there are differences there and it's very um, important to keep those in, in mind. We had a look at secondary data, key concepts and terminology you might read, we might use, um, but also the main copyright issues when it comes to secondary data use. Now, when it comes to the day two, we are um, going to have a short welcome. Um, Hina will run a nice menti exercise shortly. Uh, we hope you're going to enjoy that. And it's basically um, reminding of what we've learned yesterday. Uh, we're going to talk about data licensing and copyright. So how can you license your data, but also what it means when you use licensed data. We're talking about copyright exemptions and infringements, what happens can I use copyright exemptions and what happens if I uh, breach copyright? Um, yesterday we've seen um, some people wanted a couple of breaks. So we've spread the break in two um, 10 minutes breaks, one from 10.35 um, and the second one from 11.05. We're going to look at the copyright in the international context 
and also copyright in social media. Again, Q&A session, please to put the questions on the Padlet or you can ask them in the session as well. As mentioned at half 11, we're going to have a nice activity actually looking at the different terms and conditions in using data and trying to realize, can that data be shared? Are there any copyright um, issues with the different sources that we've picked up for you? We're going to have a short um, uh, resources and checklist presentation done by Hina. Um, of course, the links, please do use them at your own leisure. Um, and I'm also prepared for you a short presentation around showcases. So um, at the UK Data Service, but we've seen other partner archives as well, there is data that is licensed in under different terms and conditions. How do we share that? What are the methods? What are the considerations that we need to, to bear in mind? And finally, we're going to finish with a, a, a last Q&A session. We're going to check the Padlet if there are any more questions um, and also with the feedback for the event. Thank you, Oliver, so much for your attention. Um, and I'm now going to um, pass to my colleague, Hina. I'm going to stop the recording. has happened in the past. Um, so during this presentation, we're going to look at different data licensing we can apply um, and how copyright differs from one to another one um, and what it means for researchers. Just a little bit about me. I am Christina, the Collections Development Manager at the UK Data Archive um, from UK Data Service. Um, so my overall aim is to encourage as many researchers as possible to make their data available. And it's always looking um, on the full side of the glass, finding different alternatives in making data available, especially if it is derived from secondary um, data. So um, I always start by giving an introduction to the um, data benefit sharing um, benefits when it comes to data sharing. Um, and usually, and I've included the slide, if you are, for example, to um, want to use data that is not necessarily available under a license, it's always good to discuss with the data owner around why sharing their said data under a license would help the research community. And going through all the different um, stakeholders, it's always important because usually people focus on, oh, researchers publish data because the funding body makes them to do so. Um, they get a persistent identifier with increases citations. It's more focused on the researcher and the funding bodies. But it's also always important to bear in mind and to highlight actually to people that don't necessarily share their data that there is a lot of benefit when it comes to the public and the research participants. And usually when it comes to research participants, and that was a, an eye opener for everyone there. A couple of years back, there was a huge call around migration data um, in the UK. So a lot of different um, funding bodies were offering um, quite a big grants um, to collect data from uh, migrants. And UK Data Service organized a workshop actually inviting some migrants in the workshop as well. Um, and it was eye-opening because the main thing, the speaker, the migration speaker that um, came to the event was, please share our data. We want everyone to know what we're going through. So um, it's always important when using other data, if it's not available under a license, actually starting the discussion or alternatively, actually going to your institutional or national depository saying, I found this data is not under a, a license, either open license or if needed, uh, a bespoke license, because then they can approach the data owner. Now, why is important to license data? Licenses actually set who can access the data and how can they access the data? How can they use the data for which purposes? And how can they share the data? Or better said, if they can share the data, we're going to have a look at bespoke licenses in a minute. When it comes to standard data licenses for open access, we have the Creative Commons. Um, they were initially funded in 2001, um, and the first release of the licenses was a year later in December 2020, uh, 2002. Uh, but we are now currently at version four. So throughout the years, they have consulted with more and more data experts to make sure um, that their licenses can cover data very well um, and they fit for a purpose. 
before the Creative Commons being at version four, it was not actually covering data so well, especially database rights. And that's why the Open Data Commons was initiated in 2007. It was actually to replace the Tales Community License. And it was specifically designed for databases. And it was actually overcoming the shortcomings of Creative Commons versions one, two, and three. So everything before version four. We also have government licenses, open government licenses. In the UK, we have the open government license and also the open parliamentary license. Um, they allow, share, reuse, adapt. They're very, very open. But we also have open government licenses in other countries, such as in France, license ouvert. I have probably not pronounced that um, as I should, uh, which again, allow researchers to use the data, share the data, access the data. Now, we've seen yesterday um, our colleague Hannah from University of Essex discussed a little bit about Creative Commons um, and especially how it applies to publication publications. When it comes to data, we do actually see either of the versions presented here being used. So we've used the CESDA um, DMEG to present a short introduction to Creative Commons, what it means if you use, for example, CC0, it's very rarely used, especially for data. CC0 is actually a license that waives all copyright. So if you publish with a CC0, they don't have to attribute you. It's very rarely that it's used. Usually CC0 is more used for images, um, videos, things like that. CC BY um, is the most widely used open license for data currently, and the only requirement here is to attribute said data. So let's say I download the data set that's under CC BY, I create some derivation from it, I can publish my derived data as long as I nicely put an attribution to the original data source. We also have the share alike, and share alike it is used when um, the data owner wants to ensure that the license doesn't change throughout the data um, research life cycle. So if we have just CC BY, for example, I as a researcher could publish the new data under CC BY non-commercial. So I'm not letting anyone use it for commercial purposes. If the original license was CC BY share alike, it must ensure that CC by share alike is actually applied on the second data that is being created. So actually commercial use um, can be used. The most complex one, I would say, um, is the Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, non-derivatives. It is the most strict license, especially as no derivatives means others cannot actually publish derivated data from um, the original data. It is very rarely used. Um, uh, it is sometimes used with things like um, PowerPoint presentation for uh, different conferences, but very rarely used when it comes to data. It kind of makes the whole open um, license not quite useful. As I said, the Open Data Commons set up their own licenses to overcome the shortcomings of the initial Creative Commons licenses. And we have the stand standard Open Database license, which again, it's a bit more complicated than Creative Commons. People can share, create, and adapt. That's totally fine. However, attribution, share alike, and having the data kept open must be in place. So that means, for example, if a website that the researcher wants to publish the data requires registration before accessing the data, they cannot use data that is available under open database licenses because this keep open is not respected. We do, however, have the open data commons attribution license, which is just as the Creative Commons by attribution, you can share, create, adapt it as long as you attribute the original work. And the Open Data Commons have also created more recently the public domain dedication, which is again comparing with Creative Commons, 
um, Creative Commons Zero, you waive all the copyright in said collection. Anyone can share it, create it, adapt it. They do not need to put the attribution in their work. Now, besides the standard open licenses, we do have pardon me, bespoke licenses, which are usually used by either national or institutional repositories and data archives, and it supports the distributions of, of data that cannot be shared under an open license. And we usually, at the UK Data Service, we like to, to say um, open whenever possible, closed when necessary. Sometimes data cannot be shared under an open license because there might be a residual disclosure risk in there there might be a very slim chance of re-identifying an individual in a survey or in an interview so actually having a bespoke license used by an institutional repository protects protects against that specific disclosure risk i gave a couple of examples from our sister archives kisses dance fsd adp most of them are the same um, and they all um, require the same um, thing. Researchers need to register, agree to these terms and conditions before being able to use the data. Now, I'm giving the example of the UK DS3 peer license and access framework. And again, I'm thinking in terms of the disclosure risk because that's usually why data is not made available under the standard open license such as Creative Commons. At the UK DS, we do offer open, safeguarded, and controlled data. When it comes to open data, here we're talking about no real disclosure risk. It's usually not very granular data with not a lot of socio-demographic scene, or when consent to share said data as it is, is, um, is done in the consent form. We have seen this happening, especially with public figures. So for example, interviews with MPs, uh, they are usually done under Creative Commons with their names and everything. They do want that um, um, material to be assigned to them. At the UK, yes, besides the Creative Commons, we do op uh, offer the open government license and open parliamentary license as well uh, for data that comes from the government and parliament. And usually it is just a standard um, Creative Commons by when it comes to open data. Uh, we rarely have uh, collections which are share alike or non commercial because of the uh, consent used in the uh, research, in the original research. Safeguarded data is actually most of our collection um, sits under safeguarded data. And here we're talking about zero to low real disclosure risk. And I'm saying zero to low real disclosure risk. Um, disclosure risk can be calculated using a max formula. We have tools out there such as SDC Micro or Mu Argos that calculate the risk. And wherever we're calculating the risk, it's going to be higher than zero. Um, but it could be, for example, 0 0.10. Now, because there is this very minimal disclosure risk in the data, to be able to access the data, it actually requires authentication. So any researcher interested in access in the data, they might create a new UK data service account. Besides the creation of the account, we have what we call the end user license, and I'm going to show very quickly to you, which is basically asking users to treat the data confidentially, not share the data. So this is a very important point here. They cannot share the data without permission being in place. And we also might have safeguarded data that has additional conditions of use. We have a couple of data owners that sometimes want to see the publications before they are being done. Um, and we usually have a standard phrasing, please submit the publication outputs to the data owner. It's usually 10 days prior to the event that is being published. They usually like to make comments if necessary. Um, it's not validation of research, just making sure um, that the data was understood correctly. Our highest level um, is control data, and we do have 280 studies currently, um, which are available by our secure lab. It's a safe environment, and um, it can be quite a long process to gain access to control data. Researchers need to be trained. They need to pass a test. 
They need to complete a project application, which is vetted by the data owner. However, all of these are put in place, and we call this process the five safe framework. All of these are put in place because there is a real disclosure risk in the data. If that data would be combined with any other data, then potentially the research, the research participants could be easily identified. So all of these extra safeguards are put in place to protect the identity of participants and to make sure that the data is shared legally under different gateways. It could be GDPR consent. Um, in the UK, we also have the Digital Economy Act, which is an exemption. Um, so it doesn't have to be just one uh, single uh, legal gateway. When it comes to UK data service, because we were talking about licenses and we've seen from the user side, we have the end user license. But from the data owner side, we have a deposit agreement. Um, at UKDS, we do run two separate repositories. We have the self-deposit repository we share, which is for more academic data, smaller sample data, but we also have the curated repository, which is mainly for large scale data. We have a lot of governmental surveys, annual population, survey, crime survey for England and Wales, etc. In order to deposit data with UKDS, either of the repositories, there are a couple of things when it comes to copyright that the data owner must confirm. Are they the copyright owner or do they have permission to deposit said data? And sometimes it happens to say yes, when actually there might be some issues. This is never done maliciously. Um, it's done because they think, oh, it's fine. I found this data on the web and I want to publish some derived data. But we always check the different um, licenses their data has been published under. And we're going to see in the showcase, and you're more than happy to use that, we've actually developed a variable log. Um, it's available under a Creative Commons license. Um, so you're more than welcome to use it in your institution or for their own work, share it with your colleagues. Um, we do make sure that there are no infringements of any kind when it comes to rights, copyright, trademark, patent, IPR, anything. We just need to make sure. But again, we do check the data. Finally, and this applies to most repositories, the licenses are non-exclusive. That means that if said person wants to share the data by any other means, for example, share it directly with colleagues, they can do so, that is fine. We do avoid um, duplication of DOI. So we do say if it's already archived in a depository with a persistent identifier, do not deposit it in another place. Um, however, having a non-exclusive license allows others to share the data however they would like. Based on the deposit agreement, the end user license agreement, so the researchers, if you want to access data deposited at UK Data Service, you need to agree not to share the data with anyone that's not registered, to keep your password secure, um, it is a breach to actually share your account with different um, members in your institution or no matter where they are, ensuring that you preserve the confidentiality in the data file. And having said that, I, mean, I realize I have not mentioned safeguarded data cannot be personal data. So it's anonymized under GDPR. When you get GDPR, it's considered anonymized. Um, it's not only de-identified. However, there is that minimal residual disclosure risk. So researchers need to preserve the confidentiality. Very important by signing the user license, researchers need to get in touch with us if they have a publication. It increases the citations on the data and they do need to use the full citation of the data set that they are using. Now, when it comes to considerations when licensing your data, do think who is the owner of said record? Is it you, is it you and colleagues? Um, is it the institution you're from? And what we usually advise is always check with the institution whether or not they want to take ownership and copyright or maybe leave the ownership to you as a researcher, but the copyright to sit with the um, uh, institution. And there is a question on the Padlet around the difference between ownership and copyright. It's the difference between an author and a rights holder. So you might have more authors or data creators when it comes to a data collection, but the rights holders might actually be the institution 
where <laughs> the research that took place or only the PI, the principal investigator, or the funder. It depends who claims the copyright. The contents of the data. When you want to deposit data, do take into account, is my data anonymized or is my data just the identified? If it is the identified, then all of the different GDPR and data protection legislation comes into account as well. So do make sure to assess that data. If you're not sure, all the, the repositories do provide um, guidance and support. Another thing, and we see this with bespoke licenses and open licenses as well, do you want to allow commercial use? Usually commercial use is defined as if someone is making money out of the project, then they are going to be considered commercial, not to be um, confused with if a project is funded, let's say by a research council, they are not making money throughout the project, the project is funded, that usually is considered non-commercial use anyway. Finally, do take into account, do you want to share the data without any restrictions and anyone can use it, adapt it and share it with others? Or do you want, when it comes to sharing of derived data, to be first checked with you? Again, when it comes to open license, um, it, it's usually the CC by attribution that is used, so there's no permission needed. When it comes to bespoke licenses, this is where permission to publish said data is needed. Thank you all ever so much for your attention. I am now going to stop the recording. Um, copyright serves, this session is about copyright exceptions and limitations, including the copyright infringements. So copyright serves the public interest by helping to ensure that creators can earn a fair reward for their work, thus encouraging further creative endeavor and by making sure that works are properly acknowledged and respected. Um, the law also recognizes that in certain circumstances known as copyright limitations and exceptions, copyright restrictions should not apply. For example, many countries allow for copyrighted books to be adapted without the rights owner's permission to create versions that are accept accessible to people with visual impairment or other physical disabilities that make it difficult for them to use ordinary printed copies. And similarly, researchers and students are allowed to copy limited extracts of some types of copyright works, such as books, plays, musicals, scores, pictures, and photos, as long as they are carrying out non-commercial research or private study However, the amount that can be copied is restricted to fair dealing, which rules out unfair or unreasonable uses such as copying a whole film for research instead of buying DVD. So fair dealing is a legal term used to establish whether a use of copyright material is lawful or whether it infringes copyright. There is no proper definition of fair dealing. It will always be a matter of fact degree and impression in each case. Fair dealing means that the use of a copyright work under the exceptions to copyright needs to be both reasonable and justifiable. So there are certain conditions of using fair dealing exception. For example, the work must be used solely to illustrate a point. Uh, it should be used for the non-commercial research or private study with the purpose of fair dealing. Most importantly, use of a copy should be accompanied by sufficient acknowledgement, for example, in a reference or bibliography. The question to be asked is, how would a fair-minded and honest person have dealt with the work? Factors that have been identified by the courts as relevant in determining whether a particular dealing with the work is fair include, does using the work affect the market for the original work? If a use of a work acts as a substitute for it, causing the owner to lose revenue, then it is not likely to be fair. Is the amount of the work taken reasonable and appropriate? Was it necessary to use the amount that was taken? Usually one part of a work may be used. The relative importance of any one factor will vary uh, according to the case in hand and the type of deal in question. Just a follow-up 
from yesterday, someone asked about which countries are using the fair dealing exception, and I wasn't sure uh, apart from the UK. So I did check it and I found out that there are some countries that are using it with a more or less similar criteria. And those countries are Australia, Canada, India, Singapore, South Africa, New Zealand, and US. So sometimes when researchers wish to share research data by publishing or disseminating it, all the right holders need to be identified and the necessary copyright permissions be granted for data to be shared. But there are instances where one or more of the right holders are unknown or cannot be located. Such works are known as often works. So if you want to use a work within copyright, you must, with a few exceptions, seek the permission of the relevant right holder who may include their creators or publishers. It is not normally possible to reproduce the work if the right holders cannot be found. Um, in order to establish if a work is an often work, you need to carry out a diligent search by consulting the appropriate sources for the ca category of works and other protected subject matter in question. The diligent search shall be carried out prior to the use of the work. The procedure for carrying out diligent search is more or less similar everywhere, but make sure uh, you check it if there are any country specific differences before carrying out a diligent search, you should first consider the following issues as it would be a very time consuming process, whether it is really necessary to use this work and whether this work is really within the co copyright duration, you need to check that. Who are the right holders? Where did you find the work? Is it already found to be often? So, there is a long list of exceptions that are allowed. However, I have listed copyright exceptions that are relevant to the educational or research context. So the first one is non-commercial research and private study. You are allowed to copy limited extracts of work when the use is non-commercial research or private study, but you must be genuinely studying um, like you, you would if you were taking a college course. Such use is only permitted when it is fair dealing and copying the whole work would not generally be considered fair dealing. The purpose of this exception is to allow students and researchers to make limited copies of all types of copyright works for non-commercial or private study. So in assessing whether, you, you, whether your use of the work is permitted or not, you must assess if there is any financial impact on the copyright owner because of your use. Where the impact is not significant, the use may be acceptable. If your use is for non-commercial research, you must ensure that the work your work you reproduce is supported by a sufficient acknowledgement. Then text and data mining. It is the use of automated analytical techniques to analyze text and data for patterns, trends, and other useful information. Text and data mining usually requires copying of the work to be analyzed. Uh, an exception to copyright exists, which allows researchers to make copies of any copyright material for the purpose of computational analysis, if they already have the right to read the work. And this exception only permits the making of copies for the purpose of text and um, data mining for non-commercial research. Researchers, will still have to buy subscriptions to access material. This could be from many sources, including academic publishers. Publishers and content providers will be able to apply reasonable measures to maintain their network security or stability, but these measures should not prevent or unreasonably restrict researchers' ability to text and data mine. And uh, contract terms that stop researchers making copies to carry out text and data mining will be unenforceable. So um, then comes the fair dealing for criticism, review, or quotation. It is allowed for any type of copyright work. Fair dealing with the work for the purpose of reporting current events is allowed for any type of copyright work other than a photograph. In each of these cases, a sufficient acknowledgement will be required. As stated, a photograph cannot be reproduced for the purpose of reporting current events. 
The intention of the law is to prevent newspapers or magazines reproducing photographs or reporting current events which have appeared in com competitors' publications. So in terms of teaching, several exceptions allow copyright works to be used for educational purposes, such as the copying of uh, copying of works in any medium as long as the use is solely to illustrate a point, um, performing, playing, or showing copyright works in a school, university, or other educational establishment for educational purpose. However, it only applies if the audience is limited to teachers, pupils, and others directly connected with the activities of the establishment. It will not generally apply if parents are in the audience. Examples of this are showing a video for English or drama lessons and the teaching of music or making copies by using a photocopier. So uh, then helping disabled people. There are two exceptions to copyright for the benefit of disabled people. These exceptions cover you if you have a physical or mental impairment which prevents you from accessing copyright protected materials. One exception allows you or someone acting on your behalf to make a copy of a lawfully obtained copyright work if you make it in a format that helps you access the material. For example, if you buy a book from a shop, then make a braille copy to help with the visual impairment, then you are not infringing the copyright in the book. The second exception permits educational establishments and charity organizations to make, communicate, make available, distribute, and lend accessible format copies of protected works on behalf of disabled people. So the exception permits acts such as making braille, uh, audio or large print of copy books, newspapers or magazines, adding audio description to films or broadcasts, making subtitle films or broadcasts, making accessible copies of books. So uh, all um, it is allowed to copy, but it is subject to fair dealing principle. As researchers, please remember that copying the whole work would not generally be considered fair dealing. You are only allowed to copy a limited amount of fair amount. Most importantly, always remember that researchers are allowed to copy whole work data for their own analysis, but they may not be allowed to share it. The majority of uses of copyright materials continue to require permission from copyright owners. So you should be very careful when con considering whether you can rely on an exception or not. And if in doubt, you should seek legal advice. Finally, do remember that the details of the provisions will be subject to national law. And while uh, most will be similar, details will still vary from country to country. Um, for example, users of copyright works based in the UK are subject to the specific exceptions to copyright outlined in the UK's copyright law. Usually it is a civil matter. However, before you can take any action, you need to think whether infringement has really occurred. Be clear in your mind that an infringement has actually occurred and that this is not simply a case of incidental inclusion or coincidence. Um, incidental inclusion is when the work is copied by accident, for example, you are taking a photo and by accident it captured a photo in the background which is copyright protected. So in addition, you also need to consider that the work should be substantially similar in design structure or content to the degree that it can be said that the work was copied or adapted from your original rather than simply a similar idea or concept. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you so much for listening and over to you, Christina. Christina, you are muted. There it is, it's not even a Monday morning and I've done the muting. If it doesn't happen at least once, then it's not a, it's not a good event. Um, I always end up doing that. At least once I end up being on mute. Uh, now we're going to have a very short break. Um, a 10 minutes break, making sure that we um, stretch our legs um, and um, get a cup of coffee or tea um, just for 10 minutes until um, 10 to 11. So we'll see you back um, in 10 minutes. Uh, please do make sure to um, get, a, get a drink 
or um, if you want to put more questions on the Padlet, please feel free to, but it's just making sure we don't, we don't overdo it. Thank you, Christina. So this um, short session is about copyright in the international context. Um, but before I begin, um, there is a quick question for you on the Mentimeter. If you can please go to the Mentimeter and let us know which country are you from. We did ask this question yesterday, but I ask it again as there are maybe some new attendees in today's session. Thank you, Christina, for putting the code in the chat. No, no worries. Netherlands, UK. Norway. Slovenia, Sweden. That's interesting. We have a wide variety of audience. No way. Denmark, that's trusting. Switzerland. France. So that's good wide variety of attendees from all over the world. No one from Africa or Asia. Thank you for answering this quick question. So, um, every country has its own copyright laws, but over the years, there has been extensive global harmonization of copyright laws through treaties and trade agreements. These treaties and agreements establish minimum standards for all participating countries. This system leads room for local variation as many countries enact laws that grant protections above what is required. And um, one of the most significant international agreements is the Berne Convention that I have discussed yesterday. I have included it today because it would be a recap for those who have attended yesterday and uh, um, who have attended yesterday, but it would be good for the um, useful information for the new attendees. So coming back to Bern Convention, though it was signed originally, originally in 1886, but it has since been revised and amended on several occasions. So World Intellectual Property Organization serves as administrator of the treaty. This treaty lays out several fundamental principles upon which all participating countries have agreed. The minimum standards include the type of work protected, um, duration, limitations, exceptions. And one of those principles is 
national treatment, which means that all countries must give foreign works the same protection they give to the works created within their borders, assuming the other country is a signatory. So besides these, minimum principles also include the automatic protection. You do not need to register your work. The creator gains the right automatically upon creation. So the national laws are bent on the similar basic standards, but there may be variations. On a country level, the scope of copyright control is limited by um, statutory limitations and exceptions to the copyright owner's exclusive rights that permit certain reuses by law. These limitations and exceptions have not been harmonized internationally. As a result, the freedom to use the copyrighted layer of a data set by, um, for example, copying the whole set without permission depends upon the country in which the copying takes place. So this is a prime example of how and where the law is far more complex than necessary to, to chart the basic rules for when data sharing is permitted by law and when the presence of a copyrighted layer would require the copyright owner's permission. So all countries have a targeted list of uses that are permitted by law, but these lists vary considerably and the identified uses can be defined quite specifically and narrowly. So similarly, in terms of copyright duration, Bern Convention sets minimum standards for the duration of copyright protection for creative works as life of the author plus 50 years. As it sets minimums only, several countries have established longer terms of copyright for individual creators, such as life of the author plus 70 years or life of the author plus 100 years. So this is an interesting map, which gives you an idea of differences in copyright duration around the world. We can have a look at the map from a continental perspective, and we can clearly see patterns of same duration with small exemptions. So in, in Europe, all countries with the exception of one adhere to life plus 70 years. Belarus, not part of the EU, has a shorter duration, which is life plus 50 years. The EU countries respect that copyright protection is granted automatically upon creation of the work. And uh, all the countries within the European Union are signatory states of the Berne Convention. So in comparison in Africa, we can observe more variability with Angola and Libya with only life plus 25 years, Yemen life plus 30 years, and also the only country marked as life plus 99 years. So under the 1996 law, copyright in Ivory Coast lasted for 99 years after the death of the author. And under the 2016 law, this duration was dropped down to 70 years. Overall, we can see the continent is dominated by life plus 50. Um, on the Asian continent, we can observe a few countries which respect the default Bern Convention, Tajikistan, North Korea, and Vietnam, but also a country adhering to the agreement on trade-related aspects of IP rights, uh, commonly called TRIPS, same duration as Bern 50 years after death, Myanmar, and in South America, Colombia, it stands out with life plus. 80 years and similar with the Europe dominated by life plus 70 years. While in North America, Canada and uh, United States are very similar with life plus 70 years respectively, life plus 50 years, Mexico stands out and is actually the only country to adopt life plus 100 years. And um, it is effective from July 2003 non-retroactively, life plus 75 years. And uh, yeah, so you can see that there are variations around the world in terms of copyright duration. So here I have added useful links that you can check in your free time if you're interested in exploring more. Um, I have added 
a link to the Bern Convention in case anyone is interested to read more what this convention says. And um, CESDA in its data management expert guide has summed up the European diversity in copyright in terms of duration, what is protected and exceptions. And I have also added a link to the salient features of copyright law in the EU. So from a recap provided by CESDA's data management guide, I have tried to add information um, for two countries, UK and Germany, so that you can see that uh, there are national variations. In terms of duration, you can see that in Germany, it is lifetime of the author plus 70 years. However, in the UK, it depends on the type of pro protected work. For example, 70 years plus lifetime for literary and artistic works. And for sound recordings, it is 50 years from date of creation. And for typographical arrangements, it is 25 years from date of publication. And for crown copyright, the duration can be 50 years from the date of publication or 125 from the date of creation. Um, here you can see the differences in terms of what is covered under copyright in both countries in the UK. Original literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works, sound recordings, films, broadcasts, uh, cable programs, typographical arrangements, or publications are arrangement of publication are covered. On the other hand, Germany has provided a very long list um, uh, of the things, the works that are covered. So there are different. However, there are differences between the UK and Germany in terms of pento. I can't pronounce that, pantomimic works, artistic works, photographic works, and illustration of a scientific or technical nature, such as drawings, plans, maps, sketches. So you can see that there, there are differences. Finally, there are differences in terms of exceptions. UK allows exceptions in terms of fair dealing, uh, private study and non-commercial research on the contrary, Germany, allows exceptions for official works and works by authors who are in employment. So just a follow up from yesterday, there was a question from Oman. Um, so I did a quick search on Oman and found out that Oman is a signatory member of Bern Convention. So Dr. Shafiuddin, you were right that Oman is a member of the international treaty. So. According to Bern Convention, the creator can enjoy the automatic copyright protection on creation. And um, in terms of duration, dif um, different durations are set for different types of work in Oman, ranging from life plus 70 years to life plus 120 years. So thank you very much for listening. And over to you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. So this uh, brief session is about copyright in social media. So I'm sure you are all aware, very well aware of what social media is. However, just to give you, um, just to begin with, just to begin formally, I would like to quote a definition by Helen Hawke. According to this definition, social media is an umbrella term used for um, internet-based or mobile applications that allow users to form online social networks. And here is a list of some of the very popular social media platforms that the most widely used among these um, in the context of research is Twitter. Social media data available on the platform includes individual posts or tweets, what people share on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, how people comment on posts and tweets show their opinion, behavior, their likes or dislikes, visual content, such as photos and videos, interests, their social interactions, networks, and what is the current trend in any context through the data on ratings. These different platforms possess a wide variety of functions and appeal to different audiences. They all create a byproduct valuable data about the users who interact with them. Um, as social media applications grew in popularity, platforms, their capital investors and their resellers developed a business model for monetizing information generated by users, particularly by engaging 
with the commercial sector looking for consumer analysis and market research. Um, in the last decade, social media platforms have become competitive both for users and for clients to purchase the valuable data produced by the interactions of its users. Um, this business model of monetizing user data has also increased the efficiency of capturing and encoding social media content. In other words, um, the data itself comes in a form easily processed by computers with enough metadata to derive significant information about users and their behavior. Um, through this approach makes it easier um, Though this approach makes it easier to sell data to corporations, it also enables non-commercial researchers to access data for academic studies. And with access to machine-readable data, researchers are able to process large samples relatively quickly. Social media provides a source of data that can detect patterns at an unprecedented scale through computer processing. Um, social media provides a source of data that can detect patterns at an uh, unprecedented scale. And this data is usually obtained through the APIs of the social media platforms. APIs are provided by social media platforms to enable controlled access to their underlying functions and data. So API acts as an interface between the social media platform and a consumer of social media data. The API defines how the consumer can interact with the platform in technical terms and may define rules and restrictions on the access provided. For example, the time hop application shows a user's past Facebook activity on a particular day by extracting data from the Facebook platform via the Facebook API. So APIs can provide access to a stream of raw social media data, perhaps, um, as it is created on the platform by users. The Twitter streaming API allows researchers and collecting institutions to obtain tweets generated by users in real time. So accessing data through APIs provides the most authentic record of social media data. So there are just a couple of quick questions. If you can, please go to menti.com and use the code Two seven five seven three six zero eight. So, have you ever been involved in a research that involves social media data? So the majority of you have not been involved, but there are few people who have been involved in a research that involves social media data, that's good. So what do you think could be the copyright issues using social media data? You have attended so many sessions during these two days. So by now, can you guess or any thoughts on this? That's right, the social media platform has the copyright. You cannot copy large parts of the data. You give the copyright away to the social platform by the authors. Now, according to the terms and conditions of these um, social media platforms, the copyright holder is the user, but there are users do sign, um, an agreement with them that their content can be used by these platforms, but the copyright holder is the user. So 
no information about license, can I use the data? There, there is information on these platforms about their terms and conditions. You can obtain data through the platform API, but you need to check the terms and conditions. Most, um, mostly researchers are allowed to use the data, but when it comes to sharing that data for future reuse, then the researchers face a real challenge. Pictures, recordings, and other files very often don't have metadata, that's right. Yeah, thank you for your answers. I'm going back to my PowerPoint. So the terms of use for the most commonly used social media platforms are similar in terms of how they deal with intellectual property rights. Um, content is protected by copyright in the same way as books and journals. Whatever you post on these platforms is considered your creation, your content. So these platforms clearly states that the users have copyright for their own content. You are the copyright holder of your tweets or Facebook posts. So although you are the copyright holder, but when you agree to the terms and conditions to create your account on these platforms, you sign an agreement that gives the site a license to freely use the work for a variety of purposes, including an opportunity for researchers to access the data for academic research. So researchers using social media data need to abide by the terms and conditions of the platforms or API developers. Uh, terms, of, terms and conditions of these social media platforms or API developers play an important role in terms of the future uses of data, such as publishing or archiving. I'll be using Twitter as an example, as it is the most widely used uh, social media platform across the world, and it is relatively easy for researchers to collect data from it. So as an open platform, the majority of posts are available to public view and researchers can collect large numbers of tweets in a very short period of time via the platform's API. So, however, it is valuable source for research, but researchers face challenges uh, when it comes to publishing social media data or archiving it for future use. After a researcher or research team has created a data set, it is not usually possible for them to deposit that data set with an archive or collecting institution for reuse. For example, Twitter policy restricts from sharing any um, data they obtain from the API and also from storing data in a cloud. The policy does, however, allow the archiving of tweet IDs, the unique number given to an individual tree tweet or user IDs, the number assigned to Twitter account holders. Often researchers could use the tweet IDs to recreate a data used in a previous study, but only if Twitter continues to provide access to historical data. So it is not ideal, but at least it provides a better solution than sharing no information at all about data sources for published studies. Besides this, there may be another challenge. Researchers use different methods to access social media data from API, different tools, different platforms, different types of APIs, different resellers with different services, which create very diverse types of data sets. The furthermore, individual researchers use different methods to clean or organize their data, as well as different tools and methods for analyzing their data. In addition to the IDs associated with a data set information about how the raw data was collected and how it was cleaned, it is also important and will be required for recreating a data set or understanding how and why it has been altered. Therefore, the archiving of data set identifier is more effective if the processes used to create them are also documented. Twitter places particular restrictions on the form in which tweets may be published, requiring certain items of data to be retained in the published form. The forced retention of this material may pose a challenge to privacy. For example, if you need to quote some tweets while publishing, you cannot anonymize the tweets as Twitter does not allow modification in the content. 
you need to use the full tweet as it is. So you cannot archive that sort of data when it comes to data sharing. So according to the results of a survey carried out among European social science, science data archives, um, in June 2019, only two SESTA, SESTA archives store and disseminate social media data so far, which is GSIS or GSIS and UK Data Service. Both of these offer their users limited collection of social media data and mainly Twitter data. General repositories such as Zenodo, Harvard Dataverse, or Fixture hold limited but increasing number of social media data sets. Um, these repositories obtain data through self-archiving without any archive taking care over data and metadata quality. So here I have added a useful checklist, which is uh, provided by the University College London. So it is for the reviewers, but can be useful for the researchers who wish to use social media data. I let you read it quickly. That, that is a useful checklist. That's some more questions in that checklist. So Office of National Statistics UK have provided a very comprehensive data policy on social media research. I have provided a link onto the slide and uh, this policy includes a very useful checklist for researchers who intends to use social media for their research. And um, the following slides uh, are the screenshots from that checklist. So there are a few questions. You can see that there are a few questions on source selection where the, the proposed data, the best option to meet this need. So then there are a few questions related to legal compliance with does the proposed data use, does, does the proposed way of collecting data fall within the relevant legal framework? Then it is followed by questions on ethical compliance. And it has also some questions on best practice practices to uphold scientific standards and finally some questions on future uses. And that was it. Thank you very much for listening over to you Christina. Thank you ever so much Hina. Uh, we're going to go and I do apologize I have a coughing spell. Uh, we're going to now. So if you, it, it would be very useful if you do it yourself but as Christina has mentioned that um, I, I think we haven't got enough time left after the question and answer session. That was useful too. So uh, I have prepared several sources that the researcher has used for this project. And uh, I have. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, whether to check in the terms and conditions of that um, data sources, whether the data is copyright or database rights protected, if you can find out that if it is not protected, then is there any information on licenses? If so, what are the terms and conditions in terms of sharing that, that data? So uh, the World Bank Open Data is the first source I have asked you to check. So I have uh, added here the screenshots of the licenses and all the, the information related to sharing of their data licenses, whether it is copyright protected or not. So this is the screenshot in terms of license um, for World Bank open data, whoever is using that. So I let you read it quickly.
So here in the second paragraph, you can see that these data sets are provided to you under a common attribution international license, which is CC by four. So with the, with, uh, with the additional terms below. So according to the CC by, you have, I think now understand that it's okay to use it, but with attribution. So they have mentioned that there are some additional terms. So this is the screenshot of that exceptions for some third party data. So here they have written that some data sets and indicators are provided by third parties and may not be redistributed or reused without the consent of the original data provider. So I think you need to carefully check the data set you are using if the provider has listed any specific conditions to that data set or not. Otherwise, using the World Bank open data source, it's a CC by um, a required uh, license so you can use it. So then I have added a uh, pen world table source and here you can see that it's CC by, so it's okay to use it. They do not have any problem in sharing that data for, for personal use, for future use, you just need to acknowledge that. Sorry about that. So then there is a quality for annual time series. And this is a screenshot for from their terms and conditions. And you can see that in the second line, um, for your personal use, they are asking to provide you a proper citation. However, for reproduction or redistribution of these sources or substantial portions, thereof is prohibited without prior written permission from the Center for Systemic Peace. So you need permission from them. Their consent is required if you plan to share this data. <clears throat> so then uh, Microsoft Academics, uh, personal and non-commercial use limitation. The, and they have specified that um, the information available there are for your personal and non-commercial use. You may not modify, copy, distribute, transmit, display, perform, reproduce, publish, license, create derivative works from transfer, sell any information, software products obtained from the services. So this is restricted. And if you use the data from this source, then you do need to, uh, and if you plan to share it, you do need permission from the Microsoft. So then it's uh, Lexis Nexus. So here they have on the, in the first line, they say that the content on this website is for personal use only. And um, here they said that, uh, you may not copy, modify, reproduce, republish, distribute, display, or transmit for commercial, nonprofit, or public purposes, all or any portion of the website, except to the extent permitted above. And the extent is the personal use. So again, if you use this website, you do need permission from them if you plan to share your data. So there is an other screenshot from their terms and conditions regarding intellectual property rights. And I will let you read this. So it again says that if you plan to share any, include any third party, you do need a permission from Lexis next. So, the last one is from the Google Geocoding API. And these are the term, terms and conditions mentioned on their website. Users are, you will not permit your end users or directing on your behalf 
to do the following content return from the APIs, scrape, build databases, otherwise create permanent copies of such content, copy, translate, modify, misrepresent the source or ownership, remove, obscure, alter any copyright trademark. So uh, in, in this context, you also need to ask permission from the Google if you plan to share. You cannot modify the content you. So if you plan to share, you do need to ask for the permission. So these are the six sources I have added and we planned to ask, your, ask all of you to go and check the terms and conditions and see what you think, whether you any copyright protection is there, whether you can share it for future use or not, but just because of the time constraint, I just quickly show you what the terms and conditions are. So over to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Christina. So here I have uh, prepared uh, can't change my slide. Yeah, a couple of uh, very useful resources for you to have a look in your own time. So um, there I have added links to the copyright fact sheets by Naomi Kohn, and they have given in this document a very quick and useful and very easy to understand recap what copyright law is, what is covered in that law and things like this, just a quick recap. And um, I have added a link um, to a resource, um, some copyright considerations if you are working with volunteers, copyright and social media, copyright and open licenses. And then I have added a link to SESTA Data Management Expert Guide, which we have been referring throughout this session. And then there is um, uh, very useful information on UK Data Service on copyright, UK Data Service website on copyright. And um, I have added a due diligent search guidance for of often works provided by the IPO here in the UK. And um, UK Data Service has collated several copyright scenarios and what to do in that scenario. So that's a very useful resource. And um, on the UK data website, uh, they have listed very, um, I think too many copyright resources, which are really, really useful. And it's not possible to list all these resources here. So do go and check in your own time, the list of resources they have provided. So that, that's a very useful, it's a link for the main page. And on that page, you can see um, the resources listed on the website. And then you can have more information uh, on other rights, including database rights, moral rights on the UK data website, if you are interested. And um, then I have added links to some useful checklists. Um, there is a checklist for, for often works diligent search for literary works. You can, if you are interested, that's a very useful a checklist and um, then there are few checklists from copyright related to copyright clearance checklist by Naomi Kwan, um, tracing right holders checklist, negotiating rights checklist and risk assessment checklist. So yeah, so that's, these are the checklists and resources that I've added to the slides and you can have more information if you are interested. Thank you. So um, just a couple of showcases. Um, we have various examples when researchers are using secondary data, when they're using primary uh, data created by others, and they derive the data, they add to the existing data, and they do want to share um, that data with others. There are a couple of um, examples I have included, uh, but before, um, going on to the examples um, exactly, is to actually always check the data that you're using. And I've put here about archive data under bespoke licenses. Most national and institutional repositories do offer their bespoke license 
for registered users, they have terms and conditions. We've seen the example at UKDS, but in the slides, we have example for our sister archives as well. Please do have a look at them. So do make sure you check them because often um, we see researchers saying, oh, the data is publicly available via the UK Data Service website. And then if we go onto that link, it's actually safeguarded data available for registered users and they are not allowed to publish without permission. Now, what happens? Most um, of the uh, data sets that we have um, in our curated repository, they are nationally representative. For example, the English longitudinal study um, done by uh, Nats and Social Research began in 1998. We have data up to 2019. Um, it covers, again, a nationally representative sample. Um, it's a very used and very interesting study. And more and more researchers are creating derivation or harmonized data. What happens, data owners can check all these derived products that are created by different um, researchers. It is a, a time uh, problem as well, because there is a lot of derived data being created. Uh, so there is no time to check all the methodology and um, everything. So an alternative to actually publishing data is archiving the code. And we see this happening more and more often now. Uh, for example, this uh, researcher here um, has created do files. So she used Stata. And we can see I took the screenshot directly from our um, research self deposit repository. Uh, creating a nice catalog metadata actually describing Okay, so I'm going to archive do files for merging the files, cleaning the files accordingly. Most of the data that is in institutional, national, and archive repositories, it's usually already clean, it's nice to use. But when we're doing derived data, we can drop some cases. We might not be interested in specific um, samples in our population. So actually including all the, the do files or the code files is very important. Now we can also see, and we always encourage that actually archiving a short note, a short readme file, short documentation basically around exactly what was the method of deriving that data. Now I have created a very short um, checklist when archiving code, do make sure that the syntax or the code files are very clean and well formatted. Avoid including personal information. And when I'm saying avoid including personal information, of course, you might want the author. I have created this file. I put my name on it. But as um, code files go to various researchers, they might then add different information in or names that shouldn't be in there. Code and syntax files are ideally very well documented. So depending on either if you use SPSS or Stata or R, actually including comments directly in the um, code files is very well recommended. Always include the full citation. And here I'm saying, including the persistent identifier, but UK data service, we, we use DOIs done by the data size. Persistent identifiers can be printed by different other means, but including the full citation is really important because especially with um, um, long-standing studies, they don't necessarily need to be longitudinal when sweeps are being added. They could be, for example, even cross-sectional studies, but um, the data owners do add different different data throughout editions. So while in an edition you might not have specific variables, you have them in the second edition and then in the third edition they are changed again. So actually including the full citation is extremely important um, because otherwise reproducibility is not possible and others won't be able to use um, said files. Another um, note, because we were just talking in, uh, in the break around this, with archives, of course, we keep all the preservation versions. So sometimes you might have code that is published, let's say, five years ago. You don't actually have the current edition available on the website. However, most of the times data owners are actually happy releasing previous editions to researchers. Of course, they will have to be contacted. Is it okay? for us as a repository to send edition number three to this researcher that is trying to um, reproduce said work. The in-depth metadata, the catalog information is very important. And as I said, a readme file methods, it doesn't have to be a very long document, uh, even one page um, is enough, but just describing the methods you've used when deriving the data. 
Now, another um, a more recent example, and this was quite an interesting um, uh, collection that we've received, because it was around obtaining permission and actually attributing the data as well. Chin Bin has presented at several um, conferences about this data set. It has been um, downloaded a number of times, um, and it actually contains data which are subject to Royal Mail copyright. And to bear in mind with the Royal Mail copyright, they have a bespoke copyright notice that needs to be included, while all the non-addressed data is open government license, so you can reuse, adapt, share, is fine. You also have the postcode data, which is actually under Royal Mail copyright, and it can only be used for non-commercial purposes. Her Majesty Land and Registry data as well. It actually exercises copyright and database rights as well, uh, but the data is licensed under an open government license um, version three, so it's all fine for the data to be shared, adapted, adapted, and then shared, etc. Now. The data set as well contains energy performance. Again, it was a very complex collection, energy performance certificates and price pay data. Both of those are fine to be shared, are fine to be used, as long as we have the copyright notice when we provide the data to others. So um, with the researcher, we have constructed a license information for data sources here so that others can see the notices and can use the data and make sure that they use it according to the terms and conditions. Now, Hina has said, for example, we do hold Twitter data. And again, with Twitter data, is basically abiding by the terms and conditions of data uh, of uh, Twitter. We've seen with Twitter, they're fine to use the data, but when it comes to sharing, you can all only share the tweet IDs. The tweet IDs are then used by a rehydration application and other researchers can replicate the study that you have done. As we, have, as we can see here, um, this researcher has published just the uh, data as taken with the from the Twitter API with only the tweet IDs. Other researchers have downloaded the data, used rehydration software and recreated the data sets. Now, a couple of considerations when archiving derived data, always check the license. Do you need permission or is it just attribution? If you're not sure, do ask the institutional or national repository where you want to archive said data. And also do make sure, for example, most of the websites do have a contact us. Um, we do um, try to encourage all of our researchers to contact these different organizations. If they're not quite sure, okay, I can, in the UK, um, I can use the data under fair dealing, but can I share that data? It's always good to get in touch with them as soon as possible. This doesn't only apply to website data, scraping, etc. Applies even to bespoke um, license data. So we have some um, examples where new researchers, for example, they want to already use um, uh, study that is published, let's say, for example, the crime survey for England and Wales, they want to use that data to link it with maybe educational data. Before actually starting such project, we always advise researchers to get in touch either with us or directly with the data owner to check whether they would be able to publish the data. It's important to check that because especially when it comes to linkage, there is a lot of effort that needs to be put in to actually make that study very nice and uh, very well used. So it's always important if the data is under a bespoke license where permission is necessary to actually check from the beginning. And this actually leads to being able to publish the data as it is rather than just publishing the code. Um, and we see examples like that when it comes again, mostly to longitudinal studies, um, Center for Longitudinal Studies um, or the Institutional and Social Economic Research Center um, in the UK. Both of them, they've actually done collaborations with different researchers because they were contact contacted in time to actually be able to publish the data. Do take into account, and now there are two sides here. Of course, when you share the data, you can share the code as well. So others can see exactly how the derivation happened or how you've added the, uh, the variables to the data set. However, do take into account, is it necessary to share the data or just sharing the code 
is more straightforward. And it does happen most of the times the code um, suffices. And even when we're talking about um, maybe crawlers and spiders, different software that are used, even if the data cannot be um, archived, the software that is being used can be put, for example, on GitHub or other software repositories. They don't need to be GitHub. And then creating a metadata record in an institutional repository, pointing to the software, saying, I've took the data from XYZ pages. And of course, documentation, having really nice documentation around that. Now, at UK Data Service, we do have a variable log, um, and everyone here, please do share it with your colleagues. You're more than welcome to use it. Um, it's available under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial um, Share Alike um, license. Um, and what I'm going to do is much easier. I'm usually a very um, demo person. So what I am going to do, if I can find it, to actually share my screen. There it is. So uh, we've prepared this because we started to get um, quite a lot of different collections that use already published data. Um, and it was becoming harder and harder to actually track down exactly the links to where the data was taken from. So in the uh, variable log itself. We've actually included a new URL. So all the researchers need to provide us with the link to where that data was taken from, all the license information. And sometimes it happens that they start preparing the variable log and they realize, oh, actually I can't share that because it doesn't allow me to share it. It's fine that I've used it, but I can't share it. And again, we go back to a metadata metadata record. Again, please feel free to, to share this for, from, from a repository perspective. Um, it came in very handy, but from the feedback that we got from researchers as well, it came in very handy when, um, when they were preparing to deposit the data, realizing the different implications of the data that they've used. Now I am going to stop the recording. Yeah, um, there we are. Uh, thank you all ever so much for joining us for the uh, workshop around secondary data use. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed the different aspects that we've covered. Uh, thank you ever so much for the feedback around the bite-sized um, sessions. We're going to take that into account and hopefully we can have different events, just more bite-sized and focused on specific topics. Um, we do know it was quite a lot to take, but we've tried to cover as much as possible from the history of copyright to the basic kind of concepts when it comes to different publications, teaching, research data, to put it under the perspective of copyright might be different depending on what is being used. We had a look at the main copyright issues in secondary data and today we've covered licensing, just a brief overview. There's so many licenses out there. One cannot have a presentation to cover all of them. Copyright exemptions and infringements. What are the copyright exemptions? And as we've seen, for example, fair dealing is used in quite a lot of um, different parts of the world. How is copyright in, in the international context, what are the difference? And we've seen that very nice map um, at how even the duration of copyright differs from one country to another one. Um, and I do remember, I'm still surprised Mexico um, is um, so far from others. It has the longest copyright duration of a hundred years. We had a look, uh, we had a look over copyright in social media. And as we've seen, especially with social media in the different types of social media from Twitter to Reddit to um, forums. It does depend on the terms and conditions. And we've also seen a couple of showcases how other people have shared derived data, either by doing some code, either by um, abiding by the terms and conditions when it came to social media. Uh, we do have a quick ask for everyone is possible to share, um, to complete our quick feedback form um, is very much appreciated. It gives us um, uh, more information about how the event was, what your 
thoughts were about the event. If you have any um, future topics that you would like covered, um, anything that you, you, you've liked around the event, anything that you haven't liked about the event, um, we would certainly um, be very grateful for you if you complete the form. As promised, I'm going to follow up with an email by the end of the week. Um, once the recordings are up on the Google Drive, you're going to still have access to the Google Drive. I'm not stopping that. Um, and please do get in touch if you have any questions we are here to help as much as possible. Thank you all ever so much for coming. This concludes our um, two day uh, workshop around copyright issues uh, in secondary data use. So I will stop the recording.